morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager of Maven Project, and I welcome you to today's session on outbreak response and pandemic readiness, uh, a session from the partnership with Maven Project and Direct Relief. It is a pleasure for Maven Project to partner with Direct Relief. And here's a little bit more about each of our organizations. Maven Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one-on-one -on -one mentoring and customized education sessions. Direct Relief is a nonprofit humanitarian medical assistance organization founded in 1948. Direct Relief supports the needs of healthcare providers and their patients worldwide. It is also my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Paul Bittinger. Uh, he is the Chief Preparedness and Continuity Officer at Mass General Brigham, Brigham and the Chief of the Division of Emergency Preparedness in the Department of Emergency Medicine at MGB. He holds the Ann L. Prestitino MPH Endowed Chair in Emergency Preparedness and is also the Director of the Center for Disease Medicine at MGH, and we are so lucky to have him as a speaker today. So I will turn this over to you. Uh, when you're ready to begin, please do. Sounds uh, great. Thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to join you and Crystal uh, and everyone uh, for this session. I want to thank the the Maven Project uh, and um, um, uh, Disaster, uh, sorry, uh, for uh, their uh, support and sponsorship of this program, uh, really, direct relief, excuse me, um, really excited uh, to participate. So we're gonna spend about an hour uh, talking about uh, a topic that maybe uh, everybody's really, really tired uh, of talking about, but I think uh, we, we we need to dive in, which is how are we ready for the next outbreak, the, the next pandemic? And, you know, clearly uh, since 2020, all of us have been deeply involved in responding to the issues caused uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, the bad news uh, is that we are not done with infectious disease threats, uh, unfortunately not by a long shot. Um, and so I uh, want to talk about what we can be doing now uh, in the, the incredible variety of clinical settings that I think are probably represented uh, in, in uh, today's audience, um, and recognize that you're pulled in a lot of different directions. So what we're going to start with actually is a discussion of general emergency preparedness and readiness. I think there's a lot um, of, of low-hanging fruit uh, that people can continue to work on that will have them more broadly ready for all sorts of disaster threats. Uh, but by the end of this, we will cone down back on the infectious disease threats, either local outbreaks or, or uh, whatever that next pandemic may be. So, you know, I want to say that from my perspective, and again, my, my whole job is emergency preparedness for healthcare organizations. Uh, in my system, we have um, about 10 acute care hospitals, but we have a number of community health centers, number of clinics, we have some critical access uh, in the hospitals. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we try and prepare across the whole gamut, but everything on this list, I think, can threaten almost all of us. Uh, you know, all of us can have our utilities fail, all of us can have our electronic systems fail, which uh, increasingly is, is a big threat to how we deliver healthcare. We've had lots and lots of supply chain disruptions. Um, things can happen in our, in our environment with severe weather. But we are going to talk about high consequence infectious diseases. And, and I think it may or may not make sense to everybody that the way we prepare for most of the things on this list actually shares a lot of commonalities. It's a little bit of a made up number, but you know, 80% of effective response to these things actually is, is the common planning, the emergency operations planning, um, not necessarily the hazard specific plan. Um, and so the, the way we define emergency preparedness in, in our system and in my program is anything that threatens your ability to deliver healthcare services that threatens your operations potentially is something you, you can uh, mobilize emergency preparedness plans and resources for. And it's partly because uh, the, the challenges we face uh, are, are really so common across the different threats. Uh, you know, we in Boston had these extraordinary snowstorms uh, in uh, 2015, where we were getting, you know, two plus feet of snow. And even in Boston, uh, that's a lot of snow, but we were getting it every week, week after week. Uh, and it really disrupted what we did. We've had the Boston Marathon bombing. We had the 2009 H1N1 pandemic that uh, certainly people 
um, you know, don't remember nearly as as, as much as, as all the recent COVID experience. But among all of those events and, and many others, we find it's really hard to communicate, um, sharing information across um, our hospitals, sharing information with our providers, with our clinicians, with our administrative staff, um, with our patients and our communities is, is, is challenging. The more stress there is, the more uncertainty there is, the, the faster things move. Um, when you can't communicate, it's really hard to coordinate. Uh, and so people start going off in different directions. Um, and you know, the, one of the common uh, definitions of a disaster is any event that, that requires more resource than you have available it doesn't make sense that if you're already by definition limited in resources in a disaster that you wouldn't use your resources as efficiently as effectively as you can uh but but that's what often happens is because of communication coordination challenges we, we are very inefficient uh, in how we use resources therefore people start making things up uh, they improvise and, and sometimes it's good often it's not so good and, and again if it's uncoordinated it's definitely not good and you can see that that causes problems in prioritization or conflict uh, among patients or responding groups, et cetera. And the last bullet point I do want to call out, I know many of you on this call, maybe most of you, care for uh, the most vulnerable in our communities, the most vulnerable in our society. And you know, the, it is very, very much true that in essentially any disaster, those who suffer most are those who have the least uh, amount of stability or resource, uh, those who are most vulnerable. Um, it's 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 a really really tragic um, irony that those who suffer most are are already the most vulnerable. So so I think you know there's a moral imperative. I think it aligns with a lot of uh, what many of you do as core missions within your communities that that we have to be prepared to try and protect those uh, who are likely to suffer most. But it's hard in the healthcare system. Um, what we do matters, uh, obviously. Um, you know, we, we have to be prepared because if we're not prepared, there are adverse, conse adverse consequences for, for life and health. We, we can't save lives the way we want to. We can't protect health the way we, we need to. But, but you know, every clinic is different, as you, you all know, right? A, a health center, a clinic is not the same as some other health center or some other clinic, even relatively geographically nearby, let alone spread out across the enormous geography of the country and, and, and more broadly. Clinics are very different than acute care hospitals. They're very different than some of the larger practices. And, and most all of us are some version of private sector. Uh, e even, you know, many of the governmental clinics um, are, are within sort of a very uh, small um, administrative sphere that, that makes them disconnected from, from the healthcare uh, system around it. So what that means is that when we have all these private entities or all these isolated entities trying to deliver healthcare within their narrow, narrow scope, um, it's a really hard system to coordinate. Um, as you all well know, acute care hospitals don't really necessarily communicate or, or collaborate well with their health centers uh, or, or the independent entities. The post-acute uh, world um, rehabilitation, skilled nursing facilities is, is again kind of siloed off on its own. Um, there really isn't much that coordinates us from disaster planning or disaster response. And, and I know, we, you know we've been trying really hard across the country to develop healthcare coalitions that would uh, unify the outpatient clinical world, the inpatient uh, acute care world, um, post-acute, EMS, public health. Uh, but I think we still have a long way to go. And, and the voice of healthcare delivery, people who really understand how to deliver healthcare, how to run clinics, um, is not always represented uh, in the policymaking um, aspects of, of how we respond to health threats. And, and then, you know, this is this is preaching to the choir, I'm sure, but all of us know that our systems are way beyond capacity anyway. We don't have the resources we need. We're trying to just do our daily jobs as best we can uh, with the resources we face. And, and, and trying to extend and even do more in a disaster, plan to do more uh, in our emergency operations plans, uh, almost doesn't make sense given the, the daily realities we're challenged by. But, you know, we we are required to be ready. Uh, this should be old news, hopefully, for everybody, but but I continue to find some folks that, that, that are not as familiar with this. All of us, if you're uh, really in the medical sphere, are, are required to, to meet certain standards for preparedness. Um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, so CMS, uh, on 2000, in 2016 published a rule uh, that requires 17 different provider types to be ready. Uh, 
um, and it, it establishes some standards for what our plans have to address uh, and how we're theoretically supposed to coordinate with one another. Um, the four key elements of the uh, rule say that you have to have a plan. Uh, the plan has to have policies and procedures that are actually looked at and tested uh, and updated, excuse me, at least annually. Um, the plan has to address communication, right? Uh, I'm sure most all of you have lived through um, some significant emergency events and, and you, you know, most everybody knows that the top one, two, three, four, five items on your after action report or on your review when you go through an event is communication, communication, communication. So, so you have to have a communication plan and, and you can't just have an emergency plan or a communications plan. You have to test it uh, and, and make sure it works. And so not just having the plan, but actually testing, training and testing on the plan um, is, is the fourth element of what CMS requires. And as you can see, uh, again, it's not just acute care hospitals, but it really is critical access hospitals. Uh, it is rural health clinics and federally qualified health centers. Um, really just about everybody who receives some degree of CMS funding uh, has, has a requirement for preparedness uh, under this rule. But I would say we continue to stay challenged across the whole country um, with the kinds of planning we're doing. Um, my world, which is uh, healthcare emergency preparedness, is a relatively new world. Um, we, as I'll say more in a second, we really... I, didn't, I don't think started taking uh, emergency preparedness in healthcare quite as seriously until about 9-11, until you know, 2001. And a lot of healthcare emergency plans back then, and some even still now, are based on a lot of myths, based on misunderstandings of how patients presented a disaster, what the real medical needs are, what the most effective strategies for response are. And there's a, there's a great uh, article from Eric Austerheide from uh, CDC uh, in 2006 that talks about all the myths uh, related to specifically mass casualty response, um, but, but about disaster planning that, that just persist and seem, seem not to go away. World Health Organization uh, has published a, a similar uh, document more recently uh, that talking about how many myths about how fast patients present, what they need, where they go for healthcare. Um, I'll just give you an example. You know, A lot of acute care hospitals still believe in a mass casualty incident, they won't get patients if there's a mass shooting or if there's a plane crash, train crash. Um, because they're not trauma centers, they're not they're not the the high level um, uh, trauma um, parts of the trauma network. And, and the reality is, eighty percent of people following a disaster will go to the closest uh, hospital, and they don't know or care whether it's a level one, two, three, or not a trauma center at all. Um, and and that means you have certain realities you have to face uh, when you're planning. And 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 what unfortunately that means for people like me in the field is that. People go through disasters, and this includes COVID, and and they publish lessons learned articles, uh, and and these lessons learned articles are unfortunately often don't reflect any new lessons learned, but but really just reflect the fact that the person who experienced the disaster learned new lessons that were well known by by others, and so a lot of us are trying really hard uh, to have us treat emergency preparedness uh, like a medical discipline. We wouldn't let people relearn cardiology for the first time when they finally have somebody come in with a heart attack. We, we have to have people more familiar with what the real disaster epidemiology is, what are the lessons, what, what are the key actions that are most effective. And, and the way you start figuring out what are those lessons you need to learn, uh, you ask yourself what's, what, what's most important in my preparedness is, is by critically looking at your risks. You know, I recognize in this audience, we have, again, a, a really broad geography. We have a whole bunch of different clinics and, and practice settings represented with a lot of different resources. And, and a one-size-fits-all approach really doesn't work here. So um, we as people uh, are, are really bad at risk assessment. Uh, everybody's familiar with you know, people not liking to fly uh, sometimes and, and preferring to drive, even if the risks of injury or death are very different uh, between those two transportation uh, modes. It's, it's that our brains think, think about risk sometimes in very non-logical ways. So we break down risk into three different categories. Um, there's the probability of any given hazard. How likely is it to happen? There's the consequence. Uh, so when it happens, how, how bad is it for patient impact or for my organization? And there's preparedness. How ready am I for the threat right now? And if you look at all of the threats you are facing, supply chain, uh, mass casualty, infectious disease, evacuation, fire, utility failures, if you look broadly across all of the hazards that you can list and you assign them values uh, for these three um, 
elements of risk, you can actually come up with an overall risk score. And that's how you sort of say, okay, here are the threats that are biggest for me right now and for, for my clinic, for my community. This is how we're going to approach emergency planning. And this is where we're going to have to go dive in deeply and try and find the data for the, the hazards that are top on our list. We have to really realistically look at our readiness and, and try and make improvements there. The way again you do it is you create good plans, uh, and and I would I would caution uh, that that one of the great myths is that we can anticipate all the disaster scenarios we're going to face. Um, you know, in Boston we've been pl planning for mass casualties, but nobody ever thought anyone would bomb a, a road race, the, the marathon. It, it wasn't really the 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 plan per se, but the planning process um, that um, it was the way that we would coordinate, the way we would communicate, the way we would mobilize resources, the way we would adapt that was extraordinarily helpful to us, not the fact that we had a specific marathon bombing plan uh, that day. So most most all of you know that, you know, this is the quote from Dwight Eisenhower um, that, that says plans are worthless, but planning is everything. I think this is relevant both internally and externally to your organizations. Going through the planning process, having your nurses, your providers, your administrators, your environmental services, your security, you know, whoever the, the relevant staff are who, broadly speaking, represent your clinical operations, participate in emergency planning processes really, really, really um, makes you more robust as an organization. And again, whether it's a, um, a grid power loss that affects your uh, clinic or, or your setting, or whether it's mass casualty incident right next to you, and again, like, I recognize clinics are very, very much not trauma centers, but some people may walk in and, and need clinical stabilization before transfer and making sure that you've thought it through what the contingencies are, what are the possibilities, and you've got a, a plan that, that is appropriate for the level of resource you have, that, that's really, really important. So these plans um, need to have some core elements. Again, a plan is not a script. It's not like a, a Shakespearean play where every line goes uh, and follows the next. Um, it, it, it involves, to begin with, incident recognition. Um, it, it may sound stupid, but not everybody knows when something that is happening is actually an emergency incident or requires use of your emergency operations plan. Um, and trying to help make sure that everybody who's in a, a leadership role, uh, in an on-duty frontline role in your clinic, uh, in, in your uh, organization, make sure they know what that means and they know how to escalate is really important because uh, a lot of times we find people are late to respond. Something wasn't the obvious uh, explosion or fire, something obvious and dramatic, but, but using the emergency operations plan for an infectious disease emergency, as we're about to talk about, um, is a really good thing because these things get complex and you need the right people at the table. Escalating, uh, activating, uh, notifying and mobilizing, meaning bring more bodies in, help lead and coordinate, help provide some organization and structure is really, really important. Constant reassessment, disasters, uh, emergencies are very dynamic things. There's a lot of misinformation or incorrect information that's shared, making sure that you are very iterative in your approach. You're always assessing, reassessing what you know, what you think you know, what resources you have, what's the, uh, what do you know about the situation you're facing. That's really important because that supports best decision-making during disaster response. You develop good systems to effectively implement the leadership choices you make, and, and you know, the goal of emergency response actually is to get back to normal. It's not just to get through whatever it is you're facing, but it's go back to the clinical operations you had before the whole event started. And so that demobilization and return to readiness is, is really the final goal of all of this. So um, again, I already told you that, that um, by definition, by some definitions in any way, a disaster is any situation that has more needs than you have resources. Um, when that happens, there's, Fair, often a fair amount of predictable chaos, particularly in these no-notice events, right? If there's a wildfire, if there's a tornado, if there's a, a community security event. And so what you need to do is try and bring order to that chaos as quickly as possible. And that's through uh, more effective command and control systems than we often use in healthcare. Otherwise, um, make sure you've got technologies or you've identified your data sources to support good situational awareness and, and that you work well with, with the other partners that you need to work with in the community. And, as far as command and control, I'd say, you know, it's really important to know that, that we as healthcare organizations, you know, doctors, nurses, advanced practice providers, lots of other, uh, all the other people in, in healthcare, 
we we often function well because we have the autonomy we need. We have so many professionals working across our, our organizations, and we have to let them make choices uh, in in how they practice because that's that's how we end up with good patient outcomes sometimes. But the more chaotic, the more the more acute the situation is, the more that independent assessment and action um, really works against us. So we we choose uh, incident command systems. Uh, or incident management systems for healthcare organizations to kind of pivot from a lot of independent autonomy to a lot more central direction um, when the threats go up. Almost done with the background here, and we'll get into inf emerging infections in just a second, but I, I do want to acknowledge just where we're starting from. Uh, and, and ironically, all everything I'm showing you here on this slide is actually quite dated. Um, we have lost an enormous number of hospital beds uh, across the country. So the inpatient capabilities um, went down from about 1.3 million uh, in the 70s to uh, far less than a million now, 919,000 in 2019. It's actually less than that now coming out of COVID. Um, the U.S. News uh, article, I'm, I'm an emergency physician by training, that talks about the crisis in the emergency department. It's probably too small for you to read, but, but the date of that U.S. News article was September 10th. 2001, so a day before 9-11. And already we were talking about the overcrowding in the emergency department, they are, how the strain, the overload on our healthcare system was limiting our disaster readiness. That was once again uh, reinforced in 2006 by the Institute of Medicine that published the report on the right. Um, but, but you know, we're almost 20 years later than that, and the system is so much busier, especially coming out of COVID, than it ever has been. Our hospital emergency departments, your urgent care centers, your sites, I'm sure, are, are even busier than they were before. And it's really hard to talk about surge in care delivery or, or doing more when we're facing um, uh, declining resources, not, not increasing ones. You know, if you, again, if you look um, across the US healthcare system, even before COVID-19, um, only, you know, 17% of, of hospital managers in New York thought that their plans were sufficient and saw lots of barriers. I would say even again, before COVID-19, this is uh, on the right side uh, in 2019, there was there was recognition, but but not enough, unfortunately, to take action that 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 the healthcare safety net uh, and really, I think most all of the clinics and practice settings you are in, the, the, the work you do is part of the safety net uh, that, that we have across the country. Emergency departments are, are often the same, that those who are most vulnerable um, are really adversely affected disproportionately when our when our preparedness activities aren't aren't what they need to be, and and um, we've been trying to track this uh, with something called the National Health Security Preparedness Index. Um, it basically is showing that we're not making the progress we need to make, and and it also uh, like like something I showed uh, previous is showing that that we we have haves and have nots in our preparedness um big academic medical centers often the more well resourced suburban hospitals do really well but safety net hospitals federally qualified health centers community health centers frontline clinics uh critical access hospitals really struggle uh to to attain the same levels of preparedness because of the resource challenges they're facing and because they they have so few so many fewer partners to work with often depending on where they are so where did we get to with COVID-19? I'm not going to tell anybody uh, anything I think you, you don't know already, given your own lived experience. But, you know, it, it, the, the pandemic showed a, a spotlight on, on so many of our vulnerabilities, on how busy we are, on, on, on how, how limited we are in surge capacity, um, on a lot of our gaps that we kind of swept under the rug of uh, how we were training for infection control, excuse me, how well we trained on PPE donning and doffing, what our supplies were. Again, vulnerable patients. Uh, we knew we weren't doing uh, the job we needed to do with language access uh, and, and community care access otherwise. And that we're not consistent. You know, what, what one clinic does may be very different from a clinic just down the road, even within hospitals and healthcare systems. What one health center does might be very different than a practice, might be very different than the emergency department. And when, when we got into those early, uh, very fearful days of the pandemic, all of those different behaviors, those different uh, access to resource situations, they, 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 they um, put into stark relief the differences we have. I think we, we suffer from a common plan in healthcare of 
planning for the most we think we can handle as opposed to planning for the disaster that we might actually face. Uh, lots of hospitals set their mass casualty incident scenarios kind of right at the upper limit of what they think they can handle, as opposed to what legitimately they might face if they themselves had a Las Vegas shooting, had a Boston Marathon bombing, had a plane crash uh, th uh, near the, near their area. So uh, inadequate plans for the staff, uh, the space, uh, the supplies that were necessary um, caused a lot of need for adaptation quickly. Um, I think people don't appreciate uh, don't appreciate how often things change uh, in in lots of disaster events, but particularly in infectious disease emergencies. What we learn in new emer newly emerging infectious disease threats um, is so fast that that our systems didn't keep up, and that that made patients uh, and and uh, clinicians really frustrated um, uh, that they they didn't feel like they had a good handle on what they're supposed to do or what they're supposed to know. We had to uh, adapt or redeploy healthcare workers uh, in a lot of different situations that caused moral distress, moral injury uh, for some, uh, caused, uh, it definitely contributed, I think, to burnout. Um, and I think we're still, of course, seeing uh, some of those consequences now. And lastly, you know, because we couldn't surge, because the healthcare system was so overloaded uh, before we even started, Lots of us had to defer care, right? Uh, lots of us uh, tried to avoid uh, primary care visits. Uh, some of you may have had this in your clinics. We asked people not to come in during the early days of the pandemic. We asked people to, to slow down their care. And then that's caused a backlog in vaccinations. It caused us adverse uh, outcomes when people uh, weren't seeing their providers uh, for their heart failure, for their diabetes, uh, for, for other conditions. Um, and those... Uh, those deferred um, care decisions that we we made early in in in, in the pandemic have have given us unfortunately a big evidence base that that says that even in infectious disease emergencies we have to keep the door open. Um, in so many kinds of disaster events, we have to keep the door open. We have to strive to to get through uh, disasters because our our patients suffer consequences. Um, when we lock down doors and, and don't let families in, that has consequences. And, and I've already touched on burnout and fatigue and stress, but I'm, I'm sure it's part of your daily life and, and what you're trying to manage in your health centers. It's 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 a consequence that we're still, still trying to deal with. So what do we need to be doing? And now we're gonna pivot into the bio threat world specifically. Well, our future plans need to be very honest about where we are right now. What are our legitimate strains? What are our legitimate lim limitations on surge capacity? And where where is our staff uh, mentally? What can we ask them to do? What can't we ask them to do uh, in the in, in the circumstances we're facing? Um, how can we go back to the drawing board? And again, I think you all probably do this more than almost anyone else in in the healthcare system. But how do we think about our vulnerable populations first, not not last? I think there's a common mistake in healthcare preparedness planning um, that we plan for the broad community and then we say, and what about the most vulnerable? What do we need to to do to adapt? And I think at least some people are, are asking the question, well, gosh, if we, if we know that the most vulnerable are actually those who always suffer the most, shouldn't we start there? Shouldn't that be the basis of our emergency planning? And then we'll generalize to those that have more resource or have more, more access. Um, if you're not already focusing on what happens when you use your electronic health record just to deliver care, let alone how it can be adapted in bio threats, I think you may be missing a, a major threat. Uh, and the other major threat I, I, I see people not paying attention to enough is, is climate change. And how are the flooding, the wind speed, the heat risks uh, for your specific infrastructure, but then for your community, how are those things changing? And how's that changing the, the, the disaster planning you need to do? So across healthcare, I think we are not doing the planning we, we all we thought we would do after the pandemic to improve our infectious disease readiness. I don't think we're working enough uh, on our, our electronic uh, health record downtime uh, readiness and our climate change readiness. And, and um, that means we need to, to do a better job of coming together to plan, plan for these hazards. So to that point, uh, what does that really mean? Well, we actually ironically still haven't figured out a name for the kinds of special emerging pathogens or special infectious pathogens that we're, that we're planning for and, and how those are different than the normal pathogens. Certainly we have plenty of infectious disease uh, threats that are part of normal practice. We treat uh, patients uh, who have infectious illness all the time, 
but then there's something different and depends on how you look at it. Uh, sometimes we focus on those that are hazardous. They have a high mortality. Uh, we look at things that are highly infectious, easily uh, um, uh, able to infect an individual who's exposed, and, or they're highly communicable, right? Measles, mumps are some of the most communicable diseases, and they can can rip through a community very quickly if, if they're not immunized. So we struggle that we don't know which of those three categories is the most important, but you can see some examples of, of diseases there. Ebola back in 2014-15 with the West African outbreak um, really had had all three of them, and, and maybe that's part of why it got uh, so much attention, even though there really was very, very limited risk of a sustained Ebola outbreak here in the United States. There are other viral hemorrhagic fevers besides Ebola. Um, you can see them listed here, different categories of viruses. Um, not all of them are transmissible from person to person. Some require a vector, uh, either a, a, an insect vector or a rodent. Um, but, but many of these have pretty high mortality uh, and, and are pretty concerning. Uh, Crimean, Congo, hemorrhagic fever, CCHF, uh, is a bigger deal than probably most people think because it doesn't make your radar screen very often. But Ebola, Marburg, uh, Lhasa, we either have had recent outbreaks or ongoing outbreaks uh, of those uh, diseases. And again, there are other things that are not viral hemorrhagic fevers. Um, we were worried about coronaviruses before COVID. Uh, SARS and, and MERS uh, were and are uh, coronaviruses. MERS is still present in the country. Nipah, uh, uh, Hanipi virus, uh, is, is actually still uh, um, having limited outbreaks uh, in India, and I think can potentially represent uh, a concern. Monkeypox, uh, I hate saying we're fortunate, but, but there are two versions of monkeypox, and the one that is causing uh, the greatest uh, outbreak of global disease right now is, is the milder of the two um, and is behaving pretty much like a sexually transmitted disease. Doesn't mean that the other monkeypox, which has a much higher mortality, couldn't potentially be a threat we have to go revisit. But I would, I would clearly call out influenza viruses. Uh, you know, probably all of us know um, influenza is one of the most mutable infectious disease threats we face, uh, one of the most uh, significant infectious disease threats we face. And, you know, if I were to say, um, what is our greatest chance for the next pandemic, it probably still comes from an influenza virus. Um, H5N1, H7N9, you know, H's and N's, so hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins that are different than the current circulating strain. So we have H3N2, um, H2N1 and H1N1 as our strains uh, that are circulating uh, in the world now. There are other H's and N's. Uh, those influenza viruses are, are capable of infecting birds if they mutate in a way that they can now infect humans and be efficiently passed from person to person. That's that's what will be the next influenza pandemic and remains concerning for many of us. And, and then when I say uh, plus disease X at the bottom of the slide, it really is, we don't know what the next virus is. Uh, the, the, there is continued um evolution out there. There are continued ways in which we are discovering new infectious uh, diseases that humans have not seen before when we get into different corners of the world or, or animals change their migration patterns. And uh, unfortunately, we just we still don't know what that, that next disease X or that Andromeda strain might be. So it can be really, really daunting, I think, to think about just this, I, I just threw an you know, enormous number of infectious diseases at you, and it might seem like, uh, gosh, we're not even a, a specialized infectious disease clinic. We, you know, we're, we're a normal medical clinic. How do I possibly um, deal with all of those different kinds of threats and all of those different kinds of uh, ways? The good news is you really can boil this down to some simple um, structural planning elements and some structural training elements uh, for your staff. And, and the four key things, I think, four key challenges you have to address are, are the ones listed here. Most of our medical personnel across all of our practice settings, this includes me and my colleagues in, in emergency medicine, as well as urgent cares and primary care practices, you know, all of your settings, is, is you have to help people know what are these high consequence infectious diseases. That's often the term we use uh, in our setting, but HCIDs. Um, what are they, um, and and how do you keep an up to date list going? Um, right now, there are no active Ebola outbreaks in the world uh, that that I'm aware of. Um, 
but there might be one. There, there have been Ebola Sudan. There have been, there've been other outbreaks. Your clinicians have to find a way to go look it up. Um, I don't think it's realistic to expect all of our frontline personnel to really know this off the top of their heads. So, so helping people understand what are those diseases of concern that they really need to look for um, is important. We'll talk about that in a second. Secondly, if you know that you're looking for Ebola virus, you have to know what the risk factors are. Which country is the one with an outbreak or which countries have an outbreak? What are the symptoms? Again, it's just not realistic given the breadth of infectious disease threats we're talking about that you expect every nurse, every doctor, every EMT, every paramedic, every health technician um, to, to know uh, those diseases. So they have to have resources they can go to find the names of the diseases of concern, to find the risk factors, the travel exposures, the other clinical symptoms. Um, if somebody says, gosh, two weeks ago, I was in X country and now I have these symptoms, you have to know whether that is within or outside of the incubation period of that disease. Uh, because, you know, for some diseases, it's two weeks. For some, it's three weeks uh, since the last possible exposure. And, and again, people have to be able to look that up. And, and lastly, if in fact they find somebody that is at risk for the disease, has the risk factors, is within the uh, appropriate transmission uh, period for the disease, well, they have to be able to put on PPE to a degree, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a second, but they have to put on PPE to protect themselves. Um, that still sounds like a lot, I expect, for, for most of you, but, but it, it's not quite as bad as, as it sounds, and I'm going to try and break it down into some simple steps. So the mantra, if you remember nothing else uh, from this talk, I would love for you to remember, if you don't already know, the identify, isolate, and inform mantra. Um, it actually uh, came out during the Ebola outbreak in 2014 uh, from a woman named Christy Koenig, uh, who's an emergency physician in California, adapted by uh, CDC. And it is a general model, I think, for infectious disease readiness for all clinical settings, no matter what your setting is. It's a great model. And I think if you build towards it, you can be much more effective and break something complex down in, into, into elements that are easy to plan for. Identify. Identify is find the right signs and symptoms, know what the diseases are that you're looking for, and, and know whether or not they're within that infectious window. So identify is the first step. As, as a mentor of mine said long ago when I was training in medicine, if you don't know uh, about the disease, you're not going to be able to diagnose it. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we provide the tools and prompt our frontline nurses doing triage, prompt our advanced practice providers, physicians, uh, so that they can ask and identify. Once you identify uh, a patient, you need to be able to isolate them. And, and the level of initial isolation required is actually pretty simple. Um, it is a closed door room, ideally. Um, many of you don't have airborne infection isolation or negative pressure rooms uh, in your clinical settings. That's okay. Um, that's not to say that's the right environment for the patient to be hospitalized if they need ongoing care. But to start with effective, excuse me, effective isolation, Start with the patient in a closed door room. We'll come back to that. PPE for the medical providers, combining the PPE with limiting contact is how we manage risk for those who've been identified. And then inform is, is honestly a recognition that none of us uh, or most of us don't have the right expertise uh, to know definitively whether someone should be ruled out for Ebola or for MERS. Uh, or for the, the another clade of, of monkeypox. And so you have to have good, well-worked uh, mechanisms to work with your state epidemiologist or your local health department. Or maybe you do have a, a, an advanced infectious disease expert, but as, as probably uh, some of you have experienced, just because someone uh, is an infectious disease specialist does not necessarily mean that they're keeping on top of all of the high consequence infectious diseases and emerging infectious disease threats that are out there. So, you know, identify, isolate, and inform is the mantra. We're going to go into each one a little bit more, but, but it's all about, you know, recognizing it early to prevent other exposures later. Um, that it's just so important. So, identify. Um, by, uh, for identifying um, um, the travel history, again, you have to know what are the diseases and what are the countries. On the right, and you can see we've sort of stamped a giant for example only, but we keep a document um, readily curated within our own healthcare system 
that says, uh, what are the current outbreaks of concern that we're looking for? Um, it's our infectious disease division uh, and our emergency preparedness teams, folks on my team. And it says, what's the incubation period? So what, you know, how long is it around for? What's the disease? Right now, we are only looking at Marburg, Lhasa, MERS, uh, and novel influenza. We're not trying to look at every possible infectious disease threat, but those only those that require special infection control precautions, those that require a special level of PPE, a special heightened level of concern. Um, and then um, we do it on that right column where it has the case definition and guides, we, we maintain a curated set of, of clinical guides that tell our nurses, our advanced practice providers, others, what they should do to, to care for that patient. Now, I recognize that something like this, curating it, keeping it current, uh, might be a bit more uh, than many of you can support, but you can pair with academic medical centers or maybe your state health department or your county health department uh, to see if you can create and curate and, and update a similar list. And by having that, we keep it, we never print it. We, we keep it as a link on the computer for our uh, triage nurses, for our emergency department, our urgent care staff to be able to click on and launch it so that it's always the most up-to-date version. Curating electronic version can be really, really helpful for you. And so, you know, it's all about what's your travel or your exposure history? Were you in a hospital where there are patients with MERS? Have you been to a country with an active loss of fever outbreak? Were you around anyone who was sick? And then beyond the exposure history, what are you feeling? What are your signs and symptoms? If we answer those questions, we can usually get to the to the to the an answer to the question of is this patient at risk for the high consequence infectious disease? That's identify. For those of you that can't establish relationships with an academic medical center or health department or some other expert resource or or don't have that expertise within your own system, I do want to show you a couple of other um, resources here. Um, the CDC has a couple, the WHO has a couple. There's a great list actually I, I like a lot coming out of the UK. Um, unfortunately, none of them fully meets the needs uh, of what we're talking about, but um, but 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 they're they're certainly better than than uh, not having access to any resources. Um, part of the other way that you can really support identifying is, is with good signage and if you're lucky enough uh, to be able to build it into your electronic, Health record, do do that. Um, probably all of you have have you know fever and masking signs. Um, they should have been universal well before COVID, but they're not. If any of you are you know not continuing to support having those, if you know have you traveled, do you have a fever kinds of signage? Really would encourage you to do that and have patients, of course, put on masks at the earliest possible moment. We really have have spent a lot of time building identify into our clinical workflow. And so we actually, within our electronic health record, have the nurses ask about a travel history for every single patient who comes to the emergency department. And if yes, it actually then triggers a set of questions about signs and symptoms. We built this out with our infectious disease colleagues. We've had extraordinary buy-in and support from our nurses and we have 96% compliance with the nurses asking and documenting travel history, exposure history. And then for certain diseases, the things that are on that list I showed you before, the infectious disease of concern, it then fires what we call a best practice advisory, a pop-up warning message um, that, that links people to um, what, uh, what they need to do. So if someone has been to a country with an Ebola outbreak, they have the right signs and symptoms, they're within the window, it pops up a big warning and says, hey, this patient might be at risk of Ebola, please link to our plan. Um, in the extra sophisticated category, I, I'd point out that we, we did this thing called dot phrases, uh, which is a, a specific tool within our electronic health record that can guide our providers through the questions that, that, that uh, an infectious disease specialist would ask to determine whether or not somebody is, is actually at risk for the disease meets the case definition. So identify is, is, I think, really, really, really worth spending some time and effort and energy in, into bolstering your resources in the clinic. Um, again, the more effort you can uh, take off the, the shoulders of your nurses, of your, of your providers, I think the better you're going to be uh, at making sure you can identify all the appropriate uh, patients. Isolate is easier, actually. Uh, again, I said uh, you don't need an AII room and an airborne infection isolation room. If you have one, please do use it. Uh, but really a closed door room with the patient wearing a mask is, is an appropriate first step for isolation of, of any HCID. Um, you want to avoid unnecessary contact and, and basically 
you, the PPE, there, there is no universal high consequence infectious disease PPE really. Um, and, and there are lots and lots of risks for donning and doffing PPE incorrectly, particularly doffing, but taking it off incorrectly because then you can self-contaminate. So you can start with simply eye protection, an N95 or, or a PAPR, gown and gloves. And, and especially if you don't have, if you can avoid touching the patient, but you stay six feet away, eye protection, N95, gown, gloves, and six feet away really, really is, is good initial isolation ways to manage the risk while you get further history, while you talk to the patient about whether you need to, to transfer them to a more specialized site for further isolation and care. And then inform. So when you're when you're concerned that the patient does meet the definition, when you're concerned the patient might need to be transferred to a higher level of care for an uh, emerging infectious disease care, high consequence infectious disease care, then you have to have a very clear protocol for who calls who when. Um, I think again, in, in each of your environments, it's different. So it might be your local health department, it might be your county health department, it might be your state health department, and or the you know the epidemiologist. It might be an academic medical center that you have a, a tight affiliation with, or maybe you have your own infectious disease uh, expertise. But the key thing is, is for the most part, you want to say, is this person a PUI or not? Person under investigation, uh, PUI is the term that the CDC is using. I keep hearing that will change. I don't believe it has changed uh, yet. Um, it sounds kind of like a legal uh, term, but it's not. It's, it's really meant to be infectious disease focused. So is the patient a person under investigation or not? Um, and do they need testing or further care? Um, and it's really that expert um, person that you reach out to for inform that will help you make the determination of whether or not this is gonna be a PUI. If the person is a PUI, the, the last part of the hard work that you really need to do is develop a transfer protocol. Um, say someone walks into your clinic has been, maybe they've been working in an Ebola treatment unit uh, in, in West Africa, or in East Africa, wherever Ebola may, may be an outbreak at, at the time. Again, right now we have no active Ebola outbreaks. Um, but if somebody has the exposure history, the, the clinical symptoms, and they're going to have to be tested and cared for, well, you need to know how are you going to get that patient to a higher level site. That means you have to know what your default referral site is. Uh, that means you have to know that you have an EMS service that can do transport and I'll, I'll, I'll say more about this uh, in the next slide, but, but we know there are huge gaps in the country right now, and, and we're trying to work on them as a country, developing something called the National Special Pathogen System. It is, it is it, The National Special Pathogen System is being led by the uh, HHS Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, working with NETEC, the, the National Emerging Special Pathogen Training and Education Center, NETEC. Uh, I would point out that, that NETEC has some really good general resources for, for all practice settings, both high and low uh, resource settings. So if you haven't gone there, NETEC.org, N-E-T-E-C, great resource. Um, they are, again, working to, to build out and develop the next level of the National Special Pathogen System, somewhat like we have a trauma system. But right now, at a minimum, you should know um, where your regional emerging special pathogen treatment center is, so RESPTC. There were originally 10 of them, so one in each federal HHS region. There are 10 HHS regions of the country. All 10 have one. More recently, three have been added uh, to the system, so there are 13 currently in the country. Um, but working through your state public health department, um, you can figure out who is your regional emerging special pathogen treatment center, and you and your public health uh, um, point of contact can decide how you work with the RESPTC. So the vision is that, again, much like we have a tiered trauma system that, that we, we very often have people uh, come into hospital emergency departments who later get transferred to higher level trauma centers uh, if, if their injuries uh, warrant, we are working, lots of people are working across the country uh, to, to develop a similar infectious disease model. Um, the language has changed, so I apologize, this graphic is actually a little bit out of date. Uh, so instead of saying tiers uh, C, D, A, and B, it's actually going to be much more similar to the, the trauma system, where you have level one, two, three, and sometimes level four trauma centers. Uh, 
So, so the level one, the top tier, uh, or in the inverted pyramid here uh, on the right side of the screen, it's actually the bottom tier, but th th those centers that have the most expertise and resource are those regional emerging special pathogen treatment centers, RESPTCs that I mentioned. Um, for those of you that remember that the 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 scheme uh, that, that was set forward in 2014 for, for Ebola, um, there were hospitals that aren't regional centers, but could safely hospitalize a patient with a viral hemorrhagic fever. That in the new world uh, is, is the level two, uh, or on this slide, the tier B. Um, there still are just huge problems getting a patient initially evaluated, getting an IV in the patient, starting broad spectrum antibiotics if we're concerned about sepsis that we can't figure out, um, delivering care safely while we transfer the patient to somewhere they can be hospitalized, uh, uh, for the inpatient care of their illness. That's that that assessment initiation of care is, is on this slide, the tier C. In the new world, it'll be the level three. And then everybody else, so all the other emergency departments, urgent care centers, all of your clinics are, are in the tier D, which is trying to acknowledge we need a baseline level of emerging infectious disease readiness, high consequence and in infectious disease readiness for our healthcare system. And, and NETEC and the Joint Commission and CMS uh, and um, ASPR, everybody's working on resources to make that more accessible, make it easier. It, it again, all returns to the mantra of identify, isolate, and form. I think if you in your practice setting appropriate for, for your resources and, and your needs and, and, and uh, your partners, but if you can really work on, on implementing and uh, identify, isolate, uh, and inform, you're, you're gonna make a ton of progress. So to wrap up, um, I would say um, we know that there are a lot of challenges uh, with emerging infectious disease threats, uh, but you know because of global travel, because of commercial animal farming, because of uh, climate change and, and lots of other selection pressures, we really think there are going to continue to be a lot of infect emerging infectious disease threats. I don't think anybody can predict what which one it's going to be. I, I said influenza is probably the most likely from my perspective, but it could be something else, maybe something we've never even heard of. Whatever it is, we're going to have to adapt uh, as rapidly as we did during COVID. Identify slate and inform is the model. I really want to sort of push it as, as I think what I think is the most uh, effective framework, but you definitely need to support it. You need to help your clinicians identify emerging infectious disease. You need to figure out uh, how they're going to implement isolation and then who are your partners for inform and transfer uh, in a tiered system because ultimately it's just not realistic to think that every hospital, every clinic, every, every health center uh, can, can have an equal level of uh, high consequence infectious disease readiness. Um, it really uh, is gonna have to be tiered uh, and, and we, we need some stronger partnerships, better connections, more resources. Uh, for those hospitals and EMS uh, systems that are that are supporting uh, supporting the tiers. So thank you. Uh, I know that's a lot. I hope it was a little bit helpful uh, to all of you. Um, but um, if uh, Kristen, if there's if there are any questions, happy to try and answer them. Uh, but yeah. but just want to say thank you to everybody. Well, thank you. This was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. We do have um, a couple questions in the chat right now. I'll read them to you. This is kind of a long answer or long question. Do you know if COVID emergency telehealth is still in process? Can providers do telehealth in state in states where they do not have a license? And do you think that will be that there will be another shutdown? Got it. Uh, lots of great questions in that one. Uh, so in general, uh, with the ending of public health emergencies, the emergency waivers, both nationally and in most states, uh, maybe all states, uh, have now passed. And so a lot of uh, the, the initial expansion of telehealth um, uh, that was supported by these waivers uh, is no longer supported by the waivers. Because telehealth has absolutely exploded, uh, as we all know, um, I don't think anybody's trying to put the genie back in the bottle. I think people are really trying to support telehealth. Um, one of the great challenges uh, your, your, your uh, um, uh, uh, questioner uh, hit the nail on the head, which is the licensure issue. There's a lot of discussion about how to improve um, uh, license reciprocity across states, but right now it is still a state function for the most part. And um, that makes it actually very burdensome to providers who are trying to establish larger telehealth networks. 
I would say advocacy is huge. So go to your state governments uh, and advocate uh, for the need for this, particularly for disaster health threats, um, but also encourage uh, would encourage you to try and develop connections with, with others um, who, who are, some folks are more facile than others in doing uh, large, scale, large scale interstate licensure. Right. Um, there's one more question. I just want to remind everybody, if you do have a question, please put it into the Q&A box or the chat box, or you can even use the raise hand feature and I can unmute you and you can speak directly to Dr. Bidding, Bidinger. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Next question. I am seeing genital monkeypox in Baltimore. What would yeah. you recommend as treatment? Great question. Um, and a little bit of a complex one. Um, so we, we have uh, antiviral therapies and we have vaccine that are available and, and those uh, protocols are changing um, or at least who can deliver the therapies sometimes change as well as access to the medication. So I, I would strongly encourage uh, probably referral to um, a, uh, a specialist clinic. Uh, Genios is is uh, the, the, the vaccine, the therapy as often uh, treatment um, that, that uh, or is post-exposure prophylaxis uh, that is now uh, strongly indicated. I would also, uh, whether we give anti antiviral therapy depends a lot on the severity of the illness. It is not indicated for everyone um, and depends a bit on the immune status of the person as well as, again, severity of symptoms. So, so uh, because the therapy is in actually quite short supply, I would identify who around you has the tecoviramat um, that um, that can be used and, and reach out to them. Great, thank you. I don't see any other questions right now, but we will pause for any last minute questions. Uh, I did put a link in the chat. This is uh, for our survey. We really appreciate your feedback. So if you could complete the, the survey, that would be great. Uh, you can either copy the link from the chat or when you close out of this webinar, it will appear in a tab in your browser. Uh, so you can get it directly there as well. All right, I can keep stalling. No, I, I, well, I think we're good. We're probably three yeah. minutes away. So uh, I can do my best to give people three minutes back in, in their yes. day, whatever, think, if that's okay with you. But I just I I do so. want to thank again, uh, Direct Relief and the Maven Project. Kristen, thank you and Crystal. Uh, really a pleasure to join everybody. Thank you so much. It's fantastic. Have a great day, everyone.